people and that's what we're trying to that's what we're trying to um you know um, put forward with our um, centennial anniversary of that is to kind of think about what was our community thinking like it didn't happen overnight the 1924 uh, takeover overthrow whatever we want to call it didn't just happen um, that quickly there was, it was several years in the making and what we'd like to do is kind of understand what our community was faced with what the challenges were what the good things were um, you know along with the more um, political disruptive things and there's a lot to celebrate there it wasn't just a point of conflict that kind of you know created bad feelings since then um, it was much more taking place and that's what we're trying to kind of um, come to understand a little bit better and all in the service of you know thinking about what are we going to do with the next 100 years and as um, you know various uh, folks um, on these discussions that we've had I've always talked about is like you know um, we need to kind of find some reasons to celebrate what uh, what was uh, has what's happened in the last hundred years? We we we've demonstrated resilience. We've demonstrated a kind of unity, despite political disruptions. And interestingly enough, a lot of the situations and challenges and topics facing our great great grandparents at the time, a hundred years ago, are quite similar to our own in terms of the environment, in terms of economics, in terms of uh, governmental structures and uh, roles uh, and responsibilities of women and men education, health, all of these things were topics that they were faced with as well. So ours is a different set of problems, but in some ways it's the same old, same old, it's still kind of challenged by Indian policy in Ottawa. So that's what we want to talk about today is just sort of um, coming to understand our community a bit better through archival knowledge, pictures, discussions, um, not 1924 itself per se, but we can certainly talk about that, but kind of the lead up to that time. So that's kind of what we had in mind for today's uh, event. So, uh, and we, you know, we can talk about this more. We'll have more events like this in the future and we'll sort of, you know, talk, uh, group them around themes that we can get into. But this is just the most latest uh, series of these ongoing discussions. And they're meant to be informal, as you can tell. <laughs> um, so uh, without any further ado, then I guess um, I'll hand it back over to Taylor um, the last few years. Take it away, sir. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, I guess it'll be me and Talina, right? We're going to be co-presenting this. I'll share my screen now. Oh, okay, yeah, excuse I me. I didn't to... know if you were co-presenting, but yeah, Taylor and Talina, take it away. <laughs> oh, I'm just having some trouble sharing my screen here. I think I need to be a, a host or something. Sorry, I saw a little trouble sharing my screen. Sorry, I'm just asking our tech support. <laughs> okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. So let's pull up our slide for us. So hopefully everybody can see that okay. Looks like there's a lot of slides in there, but it's, well, it'll go fast. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Talina, would you like to talk a little bit about our logo first before we kind of get into it, just to break the ice here? I can tell yeah, you what sure. Shoni means, I mean, to make something, but um, that's yeah. the name we had come up with. But do you, would you like to kind of talk a little bit about the logo first? Sure, yeah. Um, so um, we, uh, our project is called Gashroni, and um, it sort of falls in line with what Heather and Rick are doing and contextualizing the 1924 time period, although we're looking specifically at 1900 to 1924, um, being the time when, you know, the sort of tail end of salvage collecting and, and um, you know, really rigorous anthropological and historical study within our communities. Um, we're focused right now on one specific collection and we hope to branch out to more collections in the future. But this collection that we'll be showing you a lot from today um, is the Frederick Waugh collection. And it was collected between 1911 and 1924, primarily in Six Nations, but also in Ganawage, Oneida on the Thames, Onondaga, New York, um, and Tonawanda, New York. So um, we have pictures, we have really detailed field notes. Um, we have 157 stories, and we also have 552 items of material culture, which are currently at the Canadian Museum of History. Um, and we're in the works to bring this collection um, 
both physically and digitally back to the communities. So this is what our um, project is about doing, essentially um, contextualizing, um, making available to the community this, this project and all these information and hopefully future collections afterwards. Uh, so our logo right here um, is, uh, we have our sky dome and inside of it, we have a, an older person and a younger person and they're um, animated to be telling stories around a fire. So to sort of pay homage to storytelling customs around fires in the past. Um, yeah, and so that's what our, our logo means. And as we move through our presentation today, um, please feel free to just throw up any questions you have in the chat. Um, hopefully we'll be able to bring um, a live website to you in the fall. And uh, there's gonna be um, a lot of educational materials, programming and things, and a lot of opportunities for community members to also um, get involved as well. So go ahead, Taylor. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay, but before we get into that, <laughs> we have to, um, we wanna show you something else first. So um, before we get into like this collection, we wanna talk about what are archives and how do I access them? And this is just a very brief rundown of it. Um, again, we could talk about it for hours, but just to save time, very briefly, materials created or received by a person, organization, public or private with enduring value contained in information. And again, like when you think of archives, you can think of these institutions, but you could also think of your own private archives within your own family. You know, whether it's your grandparents or your parents who are collecting their own photographs and, you know, who are doing archival work, but it's just not called that, you know, within the, within the household. But anyways, this is the idea of what archives are. And so what is in archives. Well, there's letters, there's maps, audio reels, manuscripts, field notes, photographs, art, newspapers, you know, the sky's the limit pretty much. And all that stuff is helpful for us to under, like, learn and understand our past as well too. Um, so that's, that's, that's in a nutshell of archives. So accessibility, it's usually in person or online. Um, and again, like some of the issues around archives though is awareness of collections. So, you know, you can know this institution exists, but if you don't know what's in there, then that's going to be a problem too. Um, of course, that's where the problem with archives is they have this information, but they don't know where it needs to go. And the people who do need this information doesn't know it exists. So it's like connecting the two together. And so that's what we hope to do today too, just to show you, you know, you can do your own research and archival research as well too. And these are the, the these are really good databases that have a lot of Haudenosaunee uh, content in there. And of course, the accessibility to non-digitized non material is another big issue as well. But <laughs> we'll say that for another day, but that, that's so you get the idea of uh, some of the issues that are going on. And if you have questions about any of that, you can always uh, put it in the chat or you know, send, a, send me a message or send me an email. And some of the archival institutions that we'll kind of talk about today is the Library and Archives Canada, Canadian Museum of History, and then the American Philosophical Society. And each one of these institutions also has elements of the wall collection inside them. So the APS had the story collection, the Canadian Museum had um, the field notes, the notebooks, uh, material collection. So I like all the objects that he collected and the photographs. And then Library and Ar Archives Canada has a lot of the, again, more of, more of his photographic collection as well too, as well as the study of other indigenous groups outside of other Shoni communities. So there's a lot of interesting stuff there. And so we'll just get right to it. Like Library and Archives Canada, uh, that's where I work as well too. I'm the community engagement officer for Library and Archives Canada. Uh, we just call it LAC. And so they're the federal repository. So anything government, is going to be in there <laughs> and they have all the published books in Canada is available there um, so they have a lot of like six nations records as well like and where it kind of ties into 1924 is it has a lot of the government's uh, records with dealing with this guy as well as dealing with you know the chiefs and council here at six nations and they also have copies of the chief minute uh, the minute books as well too the council minutes so they have a lot of material there that's digitized and if it's not being digitized it's going to be digitized and so there's just a lot of stuff that they have in there and it's really interesting. As you can see with the holdings, you know, I won't read all through that for you. You can read that yourself. I'm not gonna cover all that. But when we share this PowerPoint, you can just click on search the, search the collection link and it'll take you right to your search spot. So you can just start typing in Six Nations and then just go from there. So that's the federal repository. They have a ton of stuff in there, a lot of um, archival information, photographs, all that kind of stuff. We won't go through that too, because that's a, such a long process to go through all that, but it's really rewarding. And again, like if you maybe we could do this in a separate presentation at some point, or if you want, you know, more help with this, you can just send me an email and I'll walk you through how to do all that stuff. So again, this is one of the earlier images of our community in 1806, a watercolor by Sopronius Strenton. So this is at Library and Archives Canada as well too. 
So if you get a copy of this uh, PowerPoint, you can just click on the um, hyperlinks and it'll take you right to the source so you can read more about it. All right, so another institution that's really good is the American Philosophical Society, or the EPS. Again, it has abundance of information, a lot of Six Nations material, a lot of audio material, and a lot of it has been transferred over to the Indigenous Knowledge Center now so that you can be able to access it there as well. Um, again, like they have, we have a really good relationship with the APS. Um, they're the ones that kind of helped us get started in this project with um, prov providing us with the stories. Um, again, they have a lot of imagery. I'm sure a lot of you have even experienced the ferry before at Six Nations. You know, this is something that's before my time, but you know, um, from some of the students I've had who've actually been on this ferry before, you know, there's a lot of interesting stories in there. And so to think about like, you know, doing projects like this, you know, gathering up interviews from people who are around to talk about this and doing some type of exhibition. You know, those are the type of things that you can do with this material, you know, create projects for it. Again, there's a link to the subject guide as well too. And if it feels like I'm going really fast, it's because I am. <laughs> um, but just send me an email if you want to go through more information about certain aspects of it, okay? And then another one is Canadian Museum of History or CMH, which has like a really nice um, database as well too. You can, a lot of images from the wall collection is there as well as at the um, library and archives. So you can access a lot of the images already online. So a lot of the images have already been digitized. And there's a link to the collection search as well too. All right, and just a little bit about indigenous initiatives. So of the few that we have, so Library and Archives Canada has a few indigenous initiatives. So Listen Here Our Voices is the funding arm. Um, so if you're applying for funding to digitize material or anything like that, that's where you'd go to Listen Here Our Voices. And then we are here sharing stories as the digitization arm of the indigenous initiatives of Library and Archives Canada. And of course, project naming is something where, where they go into community and they bring a bunch of photographs and then they end up having like this event where you get together your, your old folks and your elders and you sit around and you talk about these photographs. And then they just recently launched the ebook Nation to Nation and it has a collection of uh, archivist, Indigenous archivists and it has a lot of their articles about the collections and related to their communities. Um, I have one that's in there, but it's, we're going through the process of dealing um, going through council to get permissions and stuff like that for Six Nations uh, Chiefs Council or the Pharisee Council, sorry. So that's where, it's, that's, where, that's where it kind of stopped for me, but we're working through that to get this available. And then uh, the APS is really good too, because it has the digital knowledge sharing fellowship. And that's not so much like you have to be like a academic or a PhD or something like that. If you're a community scholar and you see something at the APS, that's, you want to go study it, you know, you can apply for this uh, scholarship and you, you'll end up going out there. It's really good anyway. It, I can't guarantee you'll end up going out there, but you have a really good chance of going out there. I really recommend it anyway. It's really good. Um, all right. So we kind of flew by that, but that's pretty good because we don't really want to talk too much about this. But just tips for visiting the archives. Plan your visit. Some places require six weeks or more notice to request um, or no, well, some places require six weeks or more to notice or notice. Um, so you can request finding aids. And what finding aids are. It's just um, a list of what they have in their collections, just to put it briefly. So you can search in advance on the archive and can have materials ready for the day of your visit. And again, that's the best way to do it because the worst thing is just to show up and think when you're gonna be able to access it. Because it, you know, these, these things are in vaults and you know, it's huge. And so if you're gonna find a certain document then you have to go through all that stuff, right? So it's better to plan your visit, make contact with the archivist or a reference desk, you know, kind of build your relationship with these institutions. And then ask help from references or archivists. Ask about permissions and restrictions on material. Because that's another thing too, if you're not aware and you want to access something, but it has like this copyright or this, it's restricted and you need permissions from somewhere, it's better to get that all sorted out before you even get there because then it's just, it just saves you so much trouble and hassle <laughs> to put it lightly. All right, so that's archives. That's archives on that show. And if you have any questions about that and you want to know more information about it, you can always send me an email. But I just want to kind of dedicate more to the wall collection right now. All right, so kind of setting the historical context for us. And so I had this one originally at the start, but I, want, I figure it a bit better here. And so kind of to set up our historical context for our, our little talk today. So if anybody's ever seen this photo before, and I know I have, I've seen this photo so many times. So it's, it's just titled the last photo of the Chiefs Council, uh, 1911. Of course, it's not the last photo of the Chiefs Council, but it was the one prior to 1924. And it was so interesting because I've seen this photo before and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this photo before and kind of wondered who are these people and who's in here? And that's what's so interesting about the wall collection and the study is that it puts, it shines a light on who some of these folks are. 
So for example, I don't know if you can see it, but the man standing on the railing there, that's uh, Thomas Smoke. And it's really interesting because we got to see some, we'll see some images of him and some of his family members. But some of the things that was interesting was that his brother was originally a chief, but he died because of a train accident when they had built the rail railway. He had gotten hurt or gotten killed somehow. And uh, so they had to transfer the chief titleship to Thomas Smoke. Another person in the center, of course, is John Oscar Gibson, you have Josiah Hill, the secretary. And then you have A.G. Smith, Alexander General Smith. And then uh, there's uh, Simon Bomberry in the back, the hat. And then you have Gus Yellow. <laughs> so you have all these names, and then you'll start seeing it comes to life when you start seeing these images and stuff like that, and some of the things that they were saying and collecting. All right. <clears throat> so, Tony, would you like to talk a little bit about this? Yeah. So we covered a little bit of this just in the introduction about what is contained in this collection. Um, so um, the, the, the stories are held at the um, Canadian Museum of History and the American Philosophical Society. Um, and then the uh, material culture items, which there's um, 540, are at the Canadian Museum of History. Then we have 250 images, which we found between Canadian Museum of History and between LAC. Um, or Library and Archives Canada. Um, so we have a lot of really rich material here. And um, what we'll go through for the next several slides is just an, uh, a way to show you how you can use archives um, and sort of just give you an example of how we are using them. So Taylor and I specifically as part of this project will be um, looking to contextualize and get sort of um, capture what life was like uh, and Six Nations between 1900 and 1924. And we're gonna do that through these archives. So we're gonna look at photos, we're gonna look at items of material culture that were collected. So there's um, utensils, there's all kinds of um, games, there's everyday items, cradle boards, they even have images. I think we might have an image on here of um, the way that some women did their hair with um, um, steps for how to do it. So all of these, each piece talks to each other. So what we'll show you in the next few slides now is how there's field notes that are really detailed about how to weave um, a corn husk mat. And then um, Mrs. Bombery weaving that corn husk mat and the sorts of needles that she used to weave it. So um, all different parts of this collection when put together really make a, a more robust story of what we're looking at. Um, so next slide. And this is a picture um, of Waugh, the guy who did the, the collecting for this specific collection. There were a lot of collectors, um, a lot. So um, how Taylor had uh, sort of a breakdown of what they have at LAC. I didn't really have one of those, even though I worked at Canadian Museum of History before, I didn't really have a breakdown for you of all everything Haudenosaunee that's contained in that museum because there's quite a lot in between the photographs and the um, textual, um, and material and other archives. There's also sound recordings too, but Wa didn't make any. So here's the places where he was collecting and where he was active. This is just a map to sort of show you uh, which Haudenosaunee communities he was working in. And Taylor, feel free to jump in if you have anything to add. Otherwise, next slide. Okay, just a little quick add, uh, <coughs> add quickly that. Um, so he began in 1911 because um, we looked at some of the census records as well too. That's one thing that's really helpful is to get census records because it tracks the movement of people, right? And so if we were looking at his census records, like 1910 is a very interesting time because he's listed as a collector, he's an amateur collector. And he's moved to Toronto like, before he was from Langford, Ontario. And I'm sure some of you have driven through Langford before, that's just on like, I think Highway 52. So it's going towards Brantford, like near Keynesville. <coughs> um, yeah, it's called Langford, Ontario. So that's his hometown. So he just grew up just down the road from us, which is quite interesting. Anyway, so we find that in 1911, he ends up coming to Six Nations. And that's when he begins his research. And it goes from 1911 to 1918, excluding 1917 because of um, the war. World War I had broken out by then. And a lot of the funding had uh, kind of disappeared to do this type of work. And so that's why in 1917, he didn't actually come to any, any communities. Um, but he continued afterwards. So 1912 is probably his most busiest year because that's when he visits all, pretty, well, not all of them, but a good chunk of Haudenosaunee communities, all the way from Six Nations, London, or Oneida, 
to Ganawage, down to Onondaga, New York, and Tanawanda of all places. I'm really surprised that he went to these places. <laughs> and it's amazing because like we do have more photographs of you know folks from Ganawage, we have uh, folks from Oneida and Onondaga and Seneca. But you know our focus today is just on Six Nations of Grand River right now. Um, yeah, that, so that's that's it for me. I'll move on to the next slide. But yeah, Six Nations, he spent the most time in that community from 1911 to 1918. And I just want to emphasize how important, that's why this collection is really important, is because it gives us that window of time before all the stuff goes down with the electorate system, right, in 1924. So this gives us like this window into what was it like for people to live during this time, you know, before all the stuff starts happening. I guess things were already happening, but I'm just saying like, it gives us a little bit more of a window. All right, so a little bit about Wah. So I, I could give you like all the information about him and things like that. And you know, when he, his rise of his career and all that stuff, I thought we have already have those slides and that information. If you really want to know that kind of stuff, we can send it to you. So I thought this would be interesting to share with you instead. So one of the things in 1911, what he started doing was um, he would go to the ceremonies. <laughs> he would be invited to go to the like long house and he would sit in the ceremony. And one of the things I noticed that uh, he wrote down like the ceremony, like everything. <laughs> Like the names of the singers, the speakers, and everything, like it, the order of the ceremony and everything, like it was really detailed notes. Like we didn't have that post on here because it's, you know, it's very sensitive, but it was just interesting to see that he had like the whole like schedule of ceremonies <laughs> mapped out. Well, a couple of them anyway, I shouldn't say he has all of them. But I thought it was kind of interesting, this one, because it says right here, I asked if a white man uh, were allowed to join in the dances. I was told that they were allowed to do this if they were adopted as Indians or if favorably known by all the Indians around the boat. So that's in his notes there from attending one of the ceremonies at Kugel Longhouse there. And then I thought this was interesting because one of the letters that we were able to find, his correspondence letters with this um, archivist, uh, Helen Merrill. She, he, so just very briefly, he just talks about being uh, adopted by the Oneidas and he's given this name Talagomorox. And so he splits the sun. And so he, it's a very interesting little letter and he says, um, I'm mean, enclosing you a small quantity of Oyant Bami or native tobacco, which you can put in your peace pipe and smoke it to good fellowship and to the spirit of Thanksgiving. So yeah, this letter is very interesting too, because it's like, I don't know, it really reminds me of like if somebody was to write to another native person, you know what I mean? Or another Uncle Homie person, if you're writing a letter to them, that's kind of what it seems like anyway. Yeah. Oh, wow. and then, oh sorry, I just wanted to add just one little detail about too. Because he does talk about the ceremonies that he's been there, but the other thing that was really interesting is that, um, and this is good for when we're looking at language, um, is using the Smithsonian code or alphabet for Indian languages. So he gives you like the, the different spellings of his name, which is very interesting and very helpful for us when we're, you know, looking at the language and that, that's in this collection. Okay, sorry, go ahead, Julia. Okay. Um... He was really interesting collector specifically because he had no background or no training in the collecting methods of the time. Most of the collectors in um, North America were kind of following on Boaz's school of collecting um, and his ideas, which really focused, um, centered heavily around language, which is, is good. Um, but he didn't have a sort of agenda necessarily of his own, his own research agenda. He was just there to collect and, and he doesn't seem to um, you know, discriminate, like he's not necessarily only looking for the oldest, the best and the shiniest or most quote unquote authentic pieces. So there's all kinds of utensils. There's um, actual corn cobs, like he has um, anything you can think of really. And it wasn't all necessarily just looking for ceremonial or sacred items, which was interesting because a lot of other people were focused on at that time, actually sort of digging up people's graves and, and finding the, the rarest and most authentic examples of indigenous cultures they could. Um, so him not being trained in that sort of methodology was interesting to look at his collections in comparison with other ones of the time too. I just remembered another thing that I'd like to add as well too. Uh, one of the things that was really interesting about this collection as well is that if you ever heard of the GSC reports or geological survey, reports of Canada. So this was under the Department of Mines. Um, so this is where the museum, you know, where it fell underneath the government at the time. So it was underneath the Department of Mines. And so they put out these reports every year. And so in the 1911 report, you know, talks about the research that start beginning at Six Nations. And the reason for why people were coming to Six Nations was the museum wanted to build up the repository of information or their material culture. 
And so they had like uh, key contacts in our community, like Jonathan Gibson was one of the main contacts and uh, this PJ Atkins, which you'll see soon. Um, he was a contact in our community as well for the museum. And another thing that was really interesting about that too, uh, in terms of like the museum and like Waz work, or sorry, the GSC reports is that in his 1912 report, he talks about trying to learn, what is, what is the phrase, trying to learn Indian ways through the eyes of an Indian, you know what I mean? Or a native person. And so he lays out this 12 point plan of what he's gonna research in, in the communities. And it's really interesting. And so you'll see some samples of that as well too. It's just text, so I didn't wanna bore you with that. So I thought I'd show you something interesting, but it, it was just really like very ambitious to say that I'm going to try to understand it the way that they understand. So that kind of sets us up for something as well too. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. Would you like to talk on this one, Talina, or would you like me? You can do that one. <clears throat> okay. So this one's uh, John Jameson Jr. He's talking about storytelling. And so again, like with these field notes, it also helps us kind of give us more interesting, uh, more look at like what is going on in our, in our communities at the time. And it's interesting when you find little tidbits like this, like 10 years or so ago, people used to meet together at different houses to tell stories. They would then get someone who was good at it and then pass around the hat. They would arrange to meet some other at some other house to an, another for another evening's amusement. <laughs> but the only thing I thought that was really interesting was that. Um, so I guess what they said we were saying too is that we would get together and tell stories, but they would have somebody uh, they would pass around this hat and you would throw like you know like a small donation like trinkets or something or like tobacco or whatever you have to throw in or money or something. And I thought it was really interesting in these notes. They said if the story was really good, the storyteller would stop halfway or on a cliffhanger, he would stop halfway or she would stop halfway and he would pass that hat around again. And if you want to hear the rest of the story, you had to pay up. <laughs> that was hilarious. And then they had like this other thing too, we didn't include it in here, but they had this other thing in here. They had this thing called, um, uh, he, 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 he hat. So he hat, sorry. So they would have like a way of telling a story and then they would have like, the, they would have like a response from, you know, the, the listeners. So if they heard a part that they liked, they were supposed to say he hat. And I was talking to um, one of our older people about that, and he said he thinks it kind of come from Anadaga. Why he said he said, and so that's where it kind of comes from, I guess. And so, you know, this is interesting that you don't really hear that too often. <laughs> I have to tell you, like I wrote, a, kind of like a, a funny story too, of one of our elders too. Uh, I was talking to him about it because I wanted to know more about it too. It was a different one. His name was uh, Art. Because uh, of the name, Art Johnson. Yeah, he passed away last year. He'd come in to he'd talk about some of the stuff with us and stuff like that. And so I was really interested talking to him. And so I was asking him about that he had, or no, uh, oh, what was I saying? That he had, that he had, I was asking him about that. <laughs> he said, oh, I didn't hear that before. But he said, like, uh, people, when you hear like some kind of story that you'd say he had. And he was, I was like, what the heck does that mean? He said, well, so uh, if you didn't like it, you'd say tea hat, and it means bullshit. <laughs> you thought somebody was bullshitting or something. <laughs> so he would say that tea hat. And um, anyways, so he said, don't say that to like somebody you don't know or anything like that, or some old person that you don't know. He said, it's only for somebody that you know or something like that. So I guess like if they didn't have a way to, if they, they had a way of expressing how they didn't like your story, <laughs> let's put it that way. All right, so, all right, so let's move on to the next one. Uh, this is John Echo. Can you guide it? Sorry, my the dog is not as good. So something crooked at the end. And what was really interesting, so this guy was 80 years old at the time. So he has a numerous a bunch of stories in there. And um, this, he has a lot of stories in the collection. So he's on a daga. And he has a, a bunch of material collection as well, too. Um, we have more photographs of him. Like his stories are really interesting as well, too. Um, again, the, he has like another little stuff about like scoundo, scoundo. So tell me a story. Or Sagado, don't tell me a story, but they, he has like this. So in this notes here, I'll just zoom in real quick. So it's probably hard to see. So he's talking about he was talking about like how his grandmother told him the story about how these little kids would always be asking about telling stories and stuff like that. And then what would happen was that after a while, like if they wanted to keep hearing stories, they'd hear something. And so in this story, they talk about how these little kids kept asking to hear the story, and then they heard like a noise on the roof. And they looked up on the roof in the smoke hole and they seemed like that flying head. They just seemed like this animal or something with long hair and claws trying to get in. And so they said, that's what happens when you try to tell to me stories. <laughs> so I just thought things like that is really interesting, right? Like these type of stories are really interesting. And yeah, so anyways, we'll keep moving on. 
Oh, and then this one, I gotta tell you this one. This one is really interesting too. Sorry, Tanya, I gotta, I, I, I just wanna talk about this one. Oh, good. So, so this is one of the ones that was really interesting too. And, you know, when we're looking for stories, there's just the stories. And then, it, you know, when you grow up in our community, you, you have older people who will tell you like, or your parents will tell you like this stuff. And it's like, you can't tell if it's just a story to tell you or if it's like real, it's like real life, but they're just kind of telling you as in a story form, right? And so this is what, this is what it really reminds me of like somebody telling you something as opposed to just like a story. It's not just a story. And I, see, I notice on there, if, if you can read that, it says not much good because it's not just a story. It's actually like, it's, it's oral history. <laughs> well, it's written down anyway. So anyways, so it's how the Onondagas traveled from Jersey City to Grand River, which was pretty wild. So they said like, I guess the Onondagas were in Jersey City and they were experiencing a lot of like uh, fighting and people were getting killed and murdered. And so they sent runners and they said all directions to go somewhere. And so they finally come up to this place along the river there and they found this longhouse. They didn't know who was in there. So they, the people in the longhouse invited them in and that's when the person found out there were Cugas there. And um, so there's was, there was, there was a Cuga longhouse along the river there. There's no one near Dunville. And so we have maps of that too, some of the longhouse. Is where they are, where the longhouses were at the time, and they talk about like how they had a thing to the people there, and so that's what they asked them. You know, are the women coming with you if you want to come here? And they said yes, and so they gave them two two bundles. They gave them a bundle of dirt and a bundle of meat, and they said with the bundle of dirt or soil, they said that's for your women to show you what kind of soil we have here, and for the bundle of meat, that's for your for the women to know what kind of game we have here to hunt for the hunting. And so it was really interesting to see that. And so they said he left, and a couple of days later, some Onondagas uh, traveled down this way, and then they are moving towards the Middleport area. So again, like you get like a little piece of our history just right there, just in this little short story, right? <laughs> it's like we need to go talk to people and ask these questions more. Like we need to figure, figure this stuff out. <laughs> Sorry, I just get really excited about that. And there's just like a bunch of little things that are like that in there, and that's what really sticks out with this collection is that there's so much little cultural information. All right. Sorry, Tony, you want to talk about this? Thing? Okay, I started going through some stories again and have the same reaction. It's like, oh, oh, that, that's, <laughs> I get it. Um, so the next few slides are just kind of to show you an example of the photos that we have or the photos that you also have access to in these different archives if you um, need to look for somebody or are looking for something in specific. Um, so we have John Arthur Gibson. Um, I'm gonna try it. Uh, Scaniadio. Oh, that's pretty close. Yeah. Scaniadio. Scaniadio, <laughs> Scaniadio. okay, <laughs> in 1912. And um, he was uh, a, a community scholar who Wa spoke with a lot when he was there. Um, and then I think by 1924, he had passed away and Wa was um, looking for new people to speak with in the community. Um, just an important note is that we don't call people who shared information with the uh, outside people uh, informants. We call them community scholars or knowledge keepers or whichever they would prefer to be referred to. So just uh, something to keep in mind. And John Arthur Gibson also, that outfit he's wearing in uh, the left-hand picture, that's at the Canadian Museum of History, if anyone is interested in it. Um, next slide, unless you want to add to that. Oh, sure. I'll just add a little bit. So Jonathan Gibson is also the one that worked with Hewitt. And so if anybody, like one of the common questions I hear about is the creation story, uh, uh, Hewitt's version of the creation story. And so he did do a version with uh, Jonathan Gibson as well too. So that's the Gibson version of the creation story. And then the other person that he worked with is uh, John Alexander Goldenweiser. No, wait, A.A. A. Goldenweiser, sorry. <laughs> Alexander Goldenweiser, that's his name. <clears throat> Um, so he worked with him on Concerning the League, and so it was uh, John Gibson and his son Simeon Gibson. Uh, they did the Concerning the League, so that's like the most uh, accepted version of the Great Law in Onondaga right now. And so it's, it's called Concerning the League. Um, they have a copy of that aircraft. So it's kind of pricey, but it's really has a lot of content in there. Um, the other thing that's really interesting, too, and a lot of people may not know, is that he's, he was actually blind. So that's why he's not looking at the camera anyway, because he's blind. He said he actually got blinded, and uh, when he was a young man playing the cross, he got heat stroke or something, and ended up blinding him because of it. Anyway, so and he was also regarded as one of the most um, uh, well-known 
uh, about our culture and identity and everything like that. Uh, he was mostly well known at the time. And the other thing is he used to go uh, do the cult of Han Hanson Lake in uh, Talawanda as well too. He was, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, preacher out there. He used to go recite the code from out there as well. All right, so I'll go on to the next slide. Oh, so this one is Peter Atkins or PJ Atkins. So he, so during the first study of our Voss collection, our Voss study, uh, this was his starting point to come to PJ Atkins' store. He had a store on uh, Fifth Line. So if you are going to Fifth Line, going towards Isle Thomas, and if you can remember, there used to be a big giant bill, a big giant house on the corner there. I'm sure, like I've seen some of the names in here. I'm sure some of you've seen that before. Some of you live down the road from this place. <laughs> the house isn't there anymore, but it's just right on that corner there. Before you, it's on like Fifth Line, and what is that road with where Isle Thomas is? It's just right at that corner there. It used to be a giant house. So this is where his house was. He's the general postmaster at the time. He had a general store. Um, you actually see a lot of his um, invoices in the council minutes as well too. He provided relief for our people as well. So they could uh, bring like, they would get what they needed and then they would take their receipts to council and then he would end up uh, getting paid by council to you know provide relief for our people. And you can see like, you know, it's like the clothing and everything that's very nice clothing. And it was actually his wife was the one who was telling Wa about the cultural information and to take him to longhomes and stuff like that. It's very interesting. And it, so that's where that photo is taken anyway. Uh, there's a couple other photos of him, but I just thought it was really nice to see that. And of course, if this is your family, let us know. Like, we can help you out and try to get those photos and stuff like that. Um, all right, so we'll just keep moving on. This was an undog longhouse, 1915, taken by Wall. And I'm sure some of you remember the white, uh, the white longhouse at Onondagas. I remember that. I was just a little kid. I remember the, when they rebuilt it, the longhouse now, the early 90s. And then, of course, there's like the old cookhouse, too, that they had. And that was like in use for the longest time ever. Like it was only about the last couple of years, 10 years or so, when they rebuilt the cookhouse. <laughs> so, yeah, like, again, it's just really it's crazy to see these kind of images. I'm gonna move on to the next one. So this is uh, Simeon Gibson, uh, 1912 on the prospects. And so a little interesting tidbit too is uh, in Simeon Gibson and Mrs. Betsy Skye's son standing in front of a lacrosse vending machine, 1912. And this is really interesting because um, if you're not, if you don't know the history of uh, uh, Simeon Gibson is the one that actually ends up uh, going to, he joins in the First World War and um, ends up getting gassed. And so like when you hear his audio recordings, his voice is really high pitched at the time. It's because of the gas he got. He suffered during the First World War. So this was prior to First World War. And one of the things that's really interesting about it is the lacrosse stick making. So there's the whole process on how to make a lacrosse stick, which is amazing and quite useful. But the other thing that's really helpful as well is the language that goes with it too. So terms used in for lacrosse stick, different parts of lacrosse stick, and I hope gears are going in people's heads saying, we can make a, a project out of this. Because yes, you can, <laughs> you should. <laughs> so yes. Yeah, we, we were so hoping to um, help to start a project like that as well for different, um, different crafts and different art practices uh, that we have information for in this collection. So at some point, Hopefully, in the next couple of years, we hope to help whoever might be interested in in working on that move forward with it. And so this was uh, Mrs. Simon Gibson and her two children. So this was uh, his wife as well and his two children. It was a shame we couldn't get a picture of them all together like that. But again, just so you can see some of the families as well too. You know, it's not just one person, but it's also the people around them and their family, right? So that was interesting as well. And then you have this, this fellow here, George, George Gibson was a pitchfork. They said he was half black, um, half uh, Onondaga. It's very quite interesting. And then it's like, what is his story? And like, what, we, what can we learn about him and things like that? I don't know, it's just, just little things like that. Did you want to add anything to the photo, Talia? No, that's okay. Keep going. Okay. And I don't know, maybe Rick Montour might want to jump in and talk about this a little bit. I don't know if it's his relatives or not. <laughs> Sam Anderson and family? Yeah, they, they are. That's my, um, my grandmother's older brother. Um, Sam Anderson was a, uh, a school teacher at uh, St. John's Corners. He taught at number four, the school that was there. 
in your way back machine. And he also had a little store across from the church there. Um, he was a, uh, um, a Confederacy chief as well. He's actually a Mohawk bear, but he, uh, I think he had a Tuscarora title in the Confederacy in the 50s um, because his dad was Tuscarora. And the Andersons came from Tuscarora, the, the, the male side of the family anyway, way back when. Um, and his wife there is uh, Minnie Green, I think her maiden name was. And in, what's interesting, um, so were they, was, was Sam friends with Wa? Like, cause I've seen a, variations of these photos. There's another, another picture of the four of them sitting in a horse and buggy from about that era. Um, so anyhow, anyhow uh, yeah, so they were, they were buddies or just kind of hanging out or happened to be dressed oh. up with it. He had a camera that day or what happened? <laughs> I just thought that's how everybody dressed a long time ago. All super nice. Yeah, very, <laughs> but very I guess, like, stylish. <laughs> well, I guess what Wa did was he hired um, David Jack, which we'll see a photo of him soon, and uh, John Jameson Jr. We have another. Well, we have a photo of him as well too. We'll show that soon. Um, he hired them to take him around the community in a horse and buggy, and uh, they take him around the day and go meet different people, take photographs of people and things like that. Like we have a photo of, um, I think her name is Mrs. I'm gonna say Mrs. Katie Gibson, and she was like a hundred or close to a hundred years old at the time. You know what I mean? Like when you look at these photos and you look at how old some of these people are, like you realize that our this knowledge goes back a long time. It goes, let's say like uh, John Echo, he was 80 years old in 1915. That puts him in what around 1830s. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, if he had heard this from his grandmother, like in that story about his grandmother, right? Like how far back does that go? Like late late seventeen hundreds, early eighteen hundreds. You know what I mean? Like it's that that chain and connection of information from all the way back. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then of course, like the residential schools, what ends up cutting off that chain for a lot of folks as well too. This knowledge gets lost because of it, and because our people end up going there. But we'll just keep moving on there. One, There's one just a lot more to talk about with that. Oh yeah, tons <laughs> of stuff. That, that's great. One last thing to one last point about mm -hmm. that Sam Anderson picture. Those. The two children there on the right, I believe, is Marjorie. Uh, Marjorie Anderson went on to get a degree at McMaster University in the 1930s. And her degree was actually in French <laughs> uh, for some strange reason. Um, and I asked my dad, you know, what she did with it. And he said, oh, nothing. She, uh, she worked at an ice cream place in Rochester, New York, when she married her husband. Um, so that shows you the value of a, of a French degree back then. But that's interesting. She was probably the first Native woman to graduate from McMaster. And we now have an award uh, named on in, in her honor. And her brother on the left, I believe that's Arnold. And he also went on to be a biochemist. Um, I think he went on to Queens University. So they were educated folks. But I guess they come by natural because her dad was a school teacher. But anyway, more, uh, more fun facts. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, that was so cool, yeah, for sharing that information. Like, see, that's what's so cool about these photographs. Like, you just never know. <laughs> that was awesome. I was like, quick, tell me write those names down. <laughs> it's recorded. So this, We're is John, good. <laughs> this is John Cook and his wife. Um, so they're the parents of Elias Cook. And Elias Cook, I didn't, have, I didn't include a photo of him, but we do have a photo of him. He's one of the storytellers as well. And they say he's Kyuga and he has like a bunch of uh, stories in the collection as well. And he gives a bunch of like cultural information as well. Um, I just thought it was interesting just to see like different people as well within the collection. Don't really got too much information about them, but of course, if anybody knows more about it, definitely feel free to reach out to us. And another thing that was really interesting about the wall collection is he talked to a lot of chiefs or hereditary chiefs, like Chief David Sky, for example, on Daga. So I, he would talk about cultural information, but then at the same time, he would talk about like, you know, how to do things. So this is shows them making a fishing trap. We have more photos of this. I didn't want to kind of overwhelm everybody, but there is like um, several photographs of the stages of making this fish trap, as well as sketches of making it. And then actually seeing the fish trap in Mackenzie Creek. <laughs> so it has the fish all trap is in, in the museum as well, the actual fish trap. Yeah, oh, that reminds me too. So the other thing that he would do is uh, while I would buy um, material from people who was willing to sell, um, <laughs> I always thought that was kind of interesting because they would have, uh, I guess some of the older guys would come bring stuff and they would say, oh, this is 100 years old, this is 100 years old. And then after a while, I thought that uh, he wrote down in his notes saying that I think these guys are just telling me that's 100 years old just to get rid of their stuff. 
<laughs> so I don't know. Could be somewhere in between the middle there. <laughs> he also, um, so he did have some agendas to find older items. And it is noted that in some of the things that he had commissioned, uh, he asked people to make replicas of some the oldest style of that they can remember. So some of the items in the collection are, um, were made around 1912 by people in the community. And they were asked, can you remember the oldest way this used to be made? Like like um, utensils and, and spoons and stuff, for example, was like, didn't want, wasn't interested in people using like a, a, a typical spoon we would use today, but wanted the old version. So some of those are um, not necessarily used at that time, but made because he requested it. Um, Talina or Taylor, so is this uh, the same David Skye that had the wampum that um, Morgan went to his house? I don't know. Okay. It, it may be. I'm not sure. I don't want to say yes or no because I'm not too sure. I don't know either. I don't have an answer for you on that, but that's a good question to find out. No, I... No, I'll, I'll write it down anyway and get back to you on that because that's a really interesting thing to follow through on. All right, so I think this is a wife here, Mrs. Sky on the dog in 1815, and you know she could potentially be some of our relatives in their in our um, presentation today. <laughs> so if you are familiar, or if she looks familiar, then you know reach out. Again, um, we don't know too much about her. You know, we'd like to learn more. One of the things that we looked at some of the photos as well too is the house. You know, we don't really see too many photos of inside the house at all, but uh, with this collection, you do see some. Um, again. I should include, do a better job of including some of them, but uh, it's just interesting anyway, just to see some of the houses and stuff like that. Uh, is there anything you want to add to me? The next one I can add to. Um, okay. And the, the next series of photos with um, Mrs. Bombery, who's she's John Arthur Gibson's sister, right? Um, there's, there's a lot of photos inside of her house because she's, she's also a basket weaver. So, um, She's weaving here this corn husk rug, which I believe also in the museum, um, and a basket. She had, does a, they show you the whole um, sort of step to making a wood swim basket. And it's from half, like pounding the logs down um, to get the splints and, and everything. So there's a, a lot of pictures about this process um, with her and her husband and, and their son. And they do show a lot of different angles inside the house as well, which gives us a lot of information too. Sorry, there's just um, a question if, I think it's for the slide before, if you could go back and zoom up, zoom in on the skirt. Oh yeah, it would be the slide before. Can't, it looks like it's like lace on top of another skirt, but I can't tell for sure. I think it's an apron. Ah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it looks like an apron. I just remember some of the, some of my teachers used to say that too, like how like their moms always used to wear aprons and stuff like that. That, that makes sense. Thought it might have been beadwork. Yeah, we do have some beadwork in this collection. Not a whole lot, but I can send any pictures if anyone's looking for them specifically. Oh, and I'll zoom in on the corn stitch as well too. You know, I, 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 have, a, I have a kind of, sorry, I have a, a, a bit of a funny story about, about a, Corn husk mats. So um, several years ago, my this is my um, mom's mom now. She was a Garlow, Ruby Garlow from Frog and Third. And um, so a few years ago, my dad and I were sitting having dinner with her, having supper at her place. And my dad, my dad was interested in this old stuff. That's why I kind of like uh, take a shine to it and this kind of stuff. And he was uh, saying to my grandmother, like his mother-in-law. Um, you know, what, what, whatever, you know, do you, do you remember any corn husk mats or this or that, you know, like no one ever does that anymore. And she just kind of rolled her eyes and she said, you know what, I don't even want to ever even look at another corn husk mat. And we said, why? And she said, back when she was a kid, um, like, you know, young teenager, uh, or even younger, I think, 
uh, her and her mom would do these mats, like a whole bunch of them all week. And I go to Hagersville market to sell them to make money during the depression. She said, uh, I probably still have my hooks, like those needles that those dis descriptions are. She said, I probably still have them somewhere. But I don't, can't remember if we ever did dig them out. They might still be at the house, but that kind of thing, right? Like it was just sort of like, we think it's so cool. And she's just like, man, I don't, you know, I did that. So I made so many of those uh, to, to, you know, to feed the family literally in the depression. So it's our, it's our crafts and stuff being, you know, economic necessities, I guess, at that point too, right? So just a fun little yeah. story. Yeah. That was really common, a really common story for people as well, especially with like baskets and beadwork and, and stuff, because it was, uh, you know, people's only means of subsistence for a long time. And it really got people through. I guess they would make mattresses out of them too. I don't know if you've seen, yeah. I zoomed up on there about, about the story <coughs> that uh, Simon Bomberry talks about. If you know, he was small, I guess they would, or his grandma would throw the mats down by the old open fireplaces that they used, then used the blanket was thrown over the mats for the children to sleep upon. Bomberry called it the Indian mattresses. <laughs> I think um, there's record of that in the Jesuits as well. They, re they record people sleeping on the corn husk mats as mattresses. That's so cool. All right, we'll get moving on to the next one here. We, we said we would put in pictures and then we would go fast. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, well, well. I'm not surprised. <laughs> okay. So, this is John Jameson Jr. here. And so he is, he's, he is actually present in the, the study a lot, right from the beginning all the way to the end. Like he's there a lot. And so he's the one that uh, Wa hires a lot to go travel about. Um, it's quite interesting, like learning more about him. Um, he had the name Senegitte. And the other one that he had, uh, he had a nickname too. They called him Jiwak. And I remember asking Art Canha about that too. I said, you ever hear that name, Jivak? And he said, he did hear that name. And I guess that's, I don't know if like some, I guess that would be something to ask like, if, you know, older people, you know, if they ever heard this name Jivak before, but that's what I guess he had this nickname for. Anyways, and in one of his photos, he's just showing the old way of, uh, uh, a different way of tanning hides. And um, yeah, so there's a ton more information about him that we have. It's just so, uh, there's just a lot to talk about. <laughs> so yeah. we'll, we'll just keep moving on because oh sorry do you want to add anything to Lena it's just like no, uh, there's like this, so. yeah no you're right there's tons of information about different ways of hide tanning in there as well it'd be cool to do like a community hide tanning based on that info you know what also strikes me about some of those pictures is just how open the uh, fields and and yards are right um they seem to like, cut their grass a lot or something I don't know like <laughs> Even the earlier ones of the, of the ferry and stuff, right? It was pretty wide open. There's almost seems to be more trees now than back then. So I'm just kind of curious about that. Anyway, we got to move I'd on. I heard something. <laughs> okay, yep. <yeah. laughs> I was going to say, I heard no, no, something. No, no, I'm not trying to rush you. What, what, did, what, did, what did you hear? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, we got to rush. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I know we get like caught up with this real easy. Oh, it's some of the utensils anyway. I just want to uh, uh, just mention briefly that too. But again, you'll see information about these utensils as well. And some of them are even mentioned in the stories as well, too. So it's like some of the material objects are embedded within the story as well. It's really cool. Oh, this one I'm really excited for, too. This photo is Jim DeLuke or Jim Walker. And this was like somebody my grandma used to talk about a lot, too. <laughs> they used to talk about a Black guy who could speak Cuga that grew up in our community a long time ago. And like, it was just something you always hear about. Like, that's all they mention it here and there about Jim DeLuke. And it's funny to actually see the photograph, to actually see this person, you know? Like you hear so much about them and you finally see a photo of what they look like. And they said they spoke, spoke Gayakono, like really good. And so he says he's about 30 to 40 years old at the time. And it's really interesting is that, um, oh, where, where would I even begin? Well, the, or, like the origin story I heard from like my grandparents was that, I guess he, I don't know if he got left somewhere or he got abandoned somewhere, or he got left anyway with this old Cuga couple. And they end up raising him and they taught him like Gaia Kono and stuff like that. And they taught him the ways. And so he'd go to Longhouse and he would end up becoming a speaker and a preacher of the code. Uh, <laughs> and then what was the other one too? Um, <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you this story, but apparently some people used to ask him to go buy alcohol because he wasn't considered like an Indian at the time. And remember, you can't, if you're native at the time, you can't go and buy alcohol. It's illegal for you to have that. So I guess they would go get him to go buy him alcohol. And then uh, he'd be singing the, sitting at Longhouse 
doing the code, preaching the code, and then looking at those people that he wouldn't buy alcohol. <laughs> That's one of the stories that um, one of my relatives told me about him. <laughs> just things like that are kind of funny. <clears throat> but anyway, it's like this things like that. And so I didn't include all of it because it's some of it is all the information in this note because it does get into sensitive information. Uh, it's just more about like uh, Peach Phone and Guy and Dawana and how to play that and terms for it and like the games for it. And it was really good actually. Like it's detailed. It's how we play it today, which is amazing. Anyways, <laughs> so I, like I said, it was just really good to hear, finally hear and see this photo of this person. Like I've heard so much about him. All right. And then this is David Jack. So he has the Cuba chief as well too. And this is his family. Um, there's a whole bunch of photos. He was actually really active in the study as well. He has probably the most stories that are recorded. Um, again, like some of his stories are really amazing, like from his time growing up uh, with his grandmother and his grandmother's stories of when the Cugas lived in Dunville and Cuga area. So they have those stories that's in this collection as well. I didn't include it because there's just so much stuff to add in there. But again, you see more inside the house, you see more of the families. Of course, you see like the little dog too. And then more about the family. So Mr. David Jack, daughter and granddaughter. Again, we'd like to learn more about who these people are, more about the children. You can see she's got kind of like her, gonna say so Glanya on. You can see like the little bit there. Or maybe not, I'm not too sure. Yeah, you can see the clothing anyway. All right, we'll get moving on. Oh, I didn't include those ones. I had to cut it down actually. I had a bunch of other photos of some of the folks that are wearing um, full like traditional clothing at the time, you know, the white shirts with the, even had one that had like a, a head wrap for a Gastola. It was really interesting. I didn't, there's just so much to add, like we'd have to do another part of this. But as uh, Talina was mentioning about tanning highs, um, this is David Jack. So there's more photos of this one in particular. Um, I just wanted to share this one with you, the whole process of it. But what we were finding in the notes, is like the whole steps from one all the way down to nine and ten, like the whole process of tiny huts. <laughs> you know, it's something to think about and revitalize. Like people are shooting deer around here like crazy. So, uh, you know, it would what, be good to do like a there. comparison too. Like, is it the same 100 years later or is it like what's changed? Or, you know, it'd be cool to teach that too. Mm. To everyone just learn how to tan hides. Then it can make mock sense. <clears throat> right. All right, so I think that kind of wrap, or wrap, sort of wrapping up our photos here. So this was the one that we wanted to leave you with because this kind of sets the stage for uh, 1924. So that's Chief David Jack from the Wall Collection. But on the left is Asia R. Hill, Secretary of Six Nations Council, who has a big role in the 1924 stuff with the elected system. I'm not gonna tell you that because that will be um, Rick and Heller's job to tell you about, more about that. <laughs> but the other thing that's really interesting too is the two wampum belts that he holds. And those are the those are the wampum belts that are taken with this guy over to Geneva. <laughs> so much history in one little photograph. All right. Um, and again, th this is just, I don't know, Taylor, do you want to talk a little bit about our project? This, this um, I'll go through it's it. Just... Yeah, I'll go through it quick. Um, if anyone's interested in learning more, I'm going to be at Polytechnic tomorrow with more information and a couple of stories that we've translated. But basically, we are taking the 100, we're taking some of the 157 stories and having people translate them back into the six languages. We've started audio recordings, um, which we're going to animate uh, to help um, people can use in curriculum and schools. Um, our audience is Haudenosaunee communities, primarily Six Nations right now. but. Um, we are going to be putting together a website uh, in the future and uh, hopefully talking to as many people in the community as possible to what you'd like to see um, on that website. Um, so hopefully that'll be, a, be available, some of it, at the beginning of the fall. We have a lot of work to do. Um, next slide. So right now we have 12 stories that have been translated into five languages. We're looking for translators all the time. Um, we particularly need Seneca translators. If anyone knows any and they're interested, please pass them our way. Um, so yeah, we have languages, uh, stories translated into Mohawk, Tuscarora, Oneida, Onondaga, and Cayuga. One story is recorded for animation and we have 13 stories selected for the next year. Next slide. Uh, moving forward, we're looking into curriculum development. Like we said, website launch in the fall. We're starting our storyteller circle gatherings um, next week. If anyone is interested in that, please get in touch with me. 
Uh, we're starting collection indexing to go through the uh, notebooks and create finding aids. Um, we are starting, we've started audio recording and we plan to continue. So if there's speakers and um, language speakers and, and um, translators, uh, we're gonna have a drop-in time at Through the Red Door and we'll provide scripts. Um, all of the community involvement is paid as well. Um, and then, yeah, we'll be having animation started this summer. Next slide. Um, yeah, and so if you would like to contact us, you could contact um, our general email, gastroni at gmail.com, or you could contact myself or Taylor or Rick or Tannis um, or Kevin or Kira Brant Berkoff. If you know any of us. Now, yeah, I think that's it from us. Um, again, like there's just so much we didn't get through or yeah, we would like to cover and it. include. It's just, <laughs> I know. And then there's so much more photographs too that we have that oh, we could have more conversations on. We had like 62 slides at first. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Nyawe, that was, so that was awesome. <laughs> so everybody, if you have questions, um, I think you're able to unmute yourself so you can um, put your hand up if you want but you can also put them in the chat if that works uh, better for you and I can read them I don't know uh, Talina Taylor check out the chat because you're getting so lots of happiness and thanks <laughs> for your presentation thank you all for listening now go yeah, thanks for taking a busy time out of your schedule to, you know, come listen to our chat. They're like, it's awesome. Like, I'm glad you all were able to, you know, be here and uh, listen to us. And so just thank you. Thank you all. Yellow. So for the question about tomorrow at Polytech, it is drop in. It's part of the um, community awareness. Um, and there'll be a, a few um, archival pieces as well that have been collected in the bigger or the, not the bigger, the additional uh, exhibition project, <laughs> which is separate, but very reliant on this work, I should say, and, and very grateful for it. Uh, I believe it's from 10 on, oh yeah, thanks, Talina, 10 until two. So maybe I will start off with a question. It's kind of building on what Rick Montour put in the chat. Um, and I was wondering if you could explain um, how someone like Wa could afford to do this work. How did he finance his work or, or any of these folks that were doing this research in community? This off the top of my head, like, <clears throat> I know with uh, Frank G. Speck, who is another collector, um, he collected material and sold it to museums to fund his work. <laughs> That's all expected it. Whereas while well, he was uh, working actually for the museum at the time. So that's where he was getting paid from the government. Uh, you, there's records of um, payments he gave when he bought things. Um, so he was hired by, which was then the Geological Survey of Canada, which is now the Canadian Museum of History in one of its many iterations. Um, we used to be the Canadian Museum of Civilization. That's probably what most people would recognize it as. And they would hire, they hired a lot of people, a lot of collectors, some part-time, some full-time, Wall was full-time staff, and he was just hired by the museum. So his salary plus the museum paid for his travel and then gave him money to buy items for the collections. Oh, and the other thing too is he used to write a lot to uh, his supervisor, Dr. Edward Sapir. And so there's like a huge body of correspondence letters between Wall and uh, Sapir as well too. That's really interesting. It just adds to the mystery. Oh, shoot, you know what, too? The other thing that's really interesting that we didn't cover at the end is Wall mysteriously disappears in 1924. So he does all this body of work. 1918 happens. <laughs> 1918 happens, and he writes to Sapir saying, you know, all these people that we're talking to, and all the old people we were talking to at the time have passed away now. And one of the things that kind of runs up to that is, the, what do they call it, like Spanish flu at the time? That was running around at the same time. And so... A lot of our old people had gone, were, you know, had passed away at that time. And he said, it's just most of the young people around now. And the only person that he was really um, comfortable talking with was a Simeon Gibson, but he, had, he was gone out the war at the time. So he had gone away. And so that's kind of what ends Wall's research at Six Nations in 1918. Like a lot of the old people he had talked to had passed away at the time. So we're very fortunate that he went from 1911 
all the way up to 1918 to gather this information for us. Because now we can come back and start use, talking and sharing and, you know, what can we revitalize? Um, of course, like we always have to take things with a grain of salt. This is something I've heard from uh, my, my mentors and colleagues as well too, is that take it with a grain of salt, some of this stuff, because sometimes people just told the white guy just anything. <laughs> just to get on my way or just to get paid. Like sometimes they would just tell them whatever. But one of the things I thought that was interesting though is WA does compare notes between what somebody says about this topic compared to what somebody else, somebody said, well, no, but the other person says about it. Sorry, I'm getting tongue tied there. Anyway, she does compare some notes about an, a, a subject or a topic that I find is very interesting and that's probably for the better for us as well too. All right. Yeah. That's right too. Last seen at the bridge, at the Lachine Bridge. And so like if you ever if you run into any Ganawagi people out there, like that's what they say they have that story about the anthropologist or the ethnologist that disappeared out there. Like there's a lot of mystery around that as well, too. I don't want to be a conspiracyist or anything like that, conspiracy person, but there's a lot of interest around that as a disappearance. There was a full-on investigation by the museum. You know, they went to Ganawagi, they went to talk to people there, and you know, nothing turned up. They have no idea what happened to this person. I should tell you too, one of the things that kind of popped up that was really interesting is that his last entry in 1918 was an account of him going to Anadaga Lancos uh, during the thunder ceremony. He describes everything again. Anyways, he describes like how um, at one point in the ceremony, somebody got up, I think he said it was Joshua Buck or something. <laughs> he ended up uh, throwing some shade on Waf for being there. And he said like, why is this white guy here? He's just taking notes, he's just being nosy and curious. And uh, they said, he said that, um, the old chief Joe Logan, Josie Logan, Onondaga chief old Joe Logan, he was young at the time, stood up and said, no, he has a right to be here. And, you know, it's good that he's here to, like, you know, listen to what we're saying here and what we're doing. And so he defended him for being there. So I thought that was quite interesting because that's why I always heard before is that that's why they kicked out a lot of the anthropologists and ethnologists. That's why nobody wants to deal with them is because they took all our information and they didn't do nothing for our community. And that's why I always think it's interesting. Well, you know, I think Val can kind of get a pass because he passed, like he passed, the, he, you know, he died before he could actually do anything with it because the only thing he actually published was Iroquois Food and Preparations. So one book in 1915 is his only published work. So all that body of work that he has remained unpublished. <laughs> so he did all this great work and, you know, like, so I would like to see some type of recognition from him as well too, because he did this great body of work for us and, you know, it, it's going to help us at some point. And I think it's, you know, it's really useful right now. Uh, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and Taylor. So one of the things I did put this in the chat, it's not, it's not a question, it's a comment. Um, but if folks uh, do have um, photos from this time period, um, or material culture, so like, three-dimensional things that people made um, in their uh, personal and family collections, if you're at all interested in having a photograph, uh, a copy of a photograph included in the exhibition, the sort of idea is for the first part of the exhibition will be all these photos to help people understand what Six Nations actually looked like in this time period, what people were wearing. Uh, like Rick commented, the lack of trees. One of the big concerns is the deforestation of the community at the time. There's lots of uh, unscrupulous neighbors coming around and uh, cutting down trees. <laughs> um, and it's also an internal debate too about lumber happening in the community. So um, all of that, uh, both the people that are in the photos and their relationships, and then all the things happening in the background uh, help us to sort of get a better idea. It's as close to time travel as we can get. Uh, in, when you add it to the oral history and the written documents again. So yeah, even if you have stories in your family, um, please do get in touch uh, with uh, either Taylor and Talina or myself, um, because adding all of those things added together really helped to tell uh, a really uh, important and interesting story. Um, that's everybody's story, right? It's everybody's story in the community. So that's my pitch for the exhibit. <laughs> uh, Rick, I don't know if you wanted to add anything in here, just like calling you out of the blue. <laughs> oh, no, sure. I was just going to tie all this into 24. Uh a little bit because it's really, really interesting and important, as Talina and Taylor were saying, just to kind of have a, a snapshot into our community. 
And um, it's in, you know amazing to see all these pictures to see what kind of furniture was in the house. Like I said, they don't have many interior shots because there was no, it was just coal oil lamps and um, didn't have flash photography, right? Um, that kind of thing. So you kind of wonder, there's a handful of stuff from that time, but not much. Um, but anyway, you know, it's amazing we have what we have to sort of think about those things. But also I guess, uh, and you guys were talking about it just in the last five minutes or so, is even, um, and you know, him being called out or Wab being called out on the dog along house, like, what's he doing here? And also, like, what I wonder what his original, um, Wab's original um, inspiration to do this was. I'm wondering if because he, I forgot he grew up in so close to the reserve. Langford is like by Twin Valley Zoo or something, isn't it? Like, it's kind of not, it's not far at all. Hop, skip, and a jump from uh, Chiefswood kind of thing. Whether he had like exposure to our people, he was friendly with them. Um, I'm sure like maybe in Brantford schools or whatever, right? Uh, close proximity wouldn't be, wouldn't be difficult to just sort of take a walk and, and meet with, uh, cause didn't Simeon Gibson live just like close to the river too? Like they were mm -hmm. good friends and contemporary, well, obviously, right? And, and Simeon Gibson went missing mysteriously too for a while, they found him, right? But he disappeared too, interesting, but right. that's another story. But anyway, I guess what I'm getting at is what is the reason that our people were speaking to Wa and you know, Hewitt and Golden Wiser and all that kind of stuff. And you see the same names come up often, right? The same names who are kind of informants uh, that they that they were their go-tos. And I've done some work in the archive at uh, Philadelphia and Washington too. Um, and I won't name names, but there was a lot of our folks who were uh, selling artifacts and striking deals with, um, with these anthropologists. And that's not a bad thing. I don't see it as a bad thing. I would never be critical of them. Think they had their reasons to do so because uh, we were poor right? poor Indians was you know a stereotype for a reason so um, but it goes back to kind of also what you were saying about you can't take everything that they're sharing uh, as fact because they were just engaging in this trade economy and I trust those folks enough to know back then um, what was sacred what was not what was valuable what was not so they might have been pulling a fast one to make some money, right? So these are all things we have to keep in mind. But I trust those old timers, you know, we're still here doing this stuff. So I think they had an, you know, their own kind of agenda, but driven by economic necessity. Uh, and you see that like Pauline Johnson for his um, popular and famous as she was back in her day, she was selling wampum belts too, right? Um, so there was a market. So we have to ask ourselves, what was the reason our people were doing this for? What was their motivation? Was it purely economic or something more? And I want to think it's something more. Um, and I, it goes back to the political, that's why I'm getting back to the political thing is we knew at this point in our community that we were kind of under pressure from Ottawa to conform, right? They had their sights set on Six Nations to kind of do something with the Confederacy or something was afoot, right? Um, and I think that a lot of our people chose to speak to these you know, men mostly um, from Washington, from Ottawa, like these places, what in our minds were, you know, they were politically connected. They didn't know academics probably, or they, you know, they might have, the only piece, the only white people interested in our stuff was these, you know, collectors and, and uh, anthropologists. So we would share hoping that they would be advocates for, for our uh, political causes, right? That's what I think, uh, as well as keeping our culture alive. And our people are proud of our culture. Um, that they were willing to share. And it wasn't a closed off thing. You know, it, we, it only became closed because we were criticized for it or made to feel badly about it. When in reality, we were, you know, like I said, proud of it. This is who we are. This is the, 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 um, the basis of who we are as uh, Ungahoi people. And you would treat us better maybe if you understood that. Uh, there's all of these things kind of swirling around at the time. So, Politically, I think there was that, there was this idea that uh, they could help us. They could help us in our political causes. But there was also dissension too, because I don't think, and this is the interesting thing, that's what I wanna, I'm wondering, like did Wa, Hale, Hewitt, these guys, were they talking to the Christian dehorners? Were there, is there any evidence that, can you link any of those names with uh, the dehorner movement and what some of these um, guys, who some of these, uh, collectors and such we're talking to. 
Um, I'm just trying to think. There were there were correspondence with some of the dehorners, the Moses, the um, the Montours, this and that. Oh, you are Montours. Um, so there's some of that going on too, right? Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, have you seen any evidence of uh, in your travels or work in the archives if these folks were talking to anyone who was actively um, trying to dismantle a confederacy from within? Just as a general um, one. I think Taylor has up on the screen now, um, maybe, maybe like uh, zoom it in. This is a list of most of the people um, there's three slides uh, that Wa was speaking with. Um, I don't know. I don't know if he was more just speaking to people that were willing to speak with him so much as um, going in with an agenda to speak to anyone specifically. I think that might have came a little later with um, Fenton and his Iroquoianists to talk about that factionalism. But at this point, I think um, like we had in a comment here, a lot of it was um an in interest of preserving what was thought to be a disappearing culture so i think it was more just like who would who would speak with or provide items or information rather than like a specific agenda but i don't know what did you uh, what do you think taylor i didn't really see it too much like i don't think that's something that would, they'd ultimately advertise <laughs> so i didn't really see too much like that but the other thing I thought was interesting, though, was um, the collection or the collector who came just before Wall, and his name's uh, Sir Francis Henry Knowles, and so like he was like a sculptor, all this kind of stuff. And uh, one of his work, um, it's not widely known, but one of his work is like photographs, and so he has like these really beautiful portraits of Six Nations from nineteen, I think it's say nineteen twelve. So just before Wall comes to Six Nations. Uh, Knowles was here and he was taking all these portraits and one of them that kind of sticks out is uh, Chief A.G. Smith. I think his name's Alexander Graham Smith or Alexander General Smith, I can't remember what the G is. But he's also one of the people who's involved with uh, the elected system <laughs> and the conspiracy around it because uh, his son uh, is a soldier during the First World War. And so that's where his kind of interest lies into that too because in, as you recall like in 1924, or sorry, after the sorry, World War World War One, uh, the Soldier Settlement Act was a nightmare for Native uh, soldiers, especially in our community. You know, they're promised this land, and then it's like go talk to the chiefs, and when the chiefs say go talk to the government, they promised you that. <laughs> so there's all that kind of issues and stuff like that, and you know that you know, plays heavy on pe people's minds, especially you know chiefs who have kids who have gone to this and they're promised this stuff, and you know it's just it's a nightmare. But that's Pretty much the only thing I've seen related to that is just the one photo of A.G. Smith. Um, it's a really nice photo, though. There's another one of him and uh, Tom Key as well. They're really nice photos. I guess he was an artist or something that knows. So that's why his photographs are, like, really nice. You would think they were taken today. Like, they were so nice. Oh, I should tell you this other thing that's kind of interesting and maybe something to think about later on is that one of the things that they were, they were doing was... Um, they were measuring like the like their head or something, their skull. Like I don't know, they had measurements for their head, yeah. and then they were also measuring Craniometry. their skin tones. They yeah. were measuring their skin tones. Oh, the so anthropometry and was... craniometry so and, and craniomorphology. That was like uh, Morton's um, studies of the human body to try and prove that Indigenous people were genetically and biologically inferior to white people, so that they could. Um, move forward with their agendas of land theft and indigenous erasure. They were trying to like biologically or like scientifically prove that um, indigenous uh, heredity and, and genetics were inferior to say they're inferior species of people so they shouldn't be able to own land and stuff. Pretty brutal. Um, yeah, not to completely change the subject, <laughs> there is a really good question in there. There is a Rick, good question though. for Rick. Yeah. So yeah. the uh Rick, when you said the term uh Christian dehorners, what did you mean by that? Did I say Christian dehorners? You put them together. <laughs> I put them together. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh that's that didn't fall along the lines of um I, I've got my camera off just because my um, internet was unstable there. So um hopefully everything will be okay. I'll leave it off for now. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't mean it to sound that 
that um, black and white of a delineation between de Horners and uh, Christian because that was not the case at all. Um, but, uh, and I forget the context of it, but anyway, um, the de Horner movement was a political movement that was, um, um, it was, it was largely led by, by Christian folks on the reserve, but not entirely by any means, but basically just people who were um, um, dissatisfied, I guess, with the Confederacy Council. And so that began way back when, uh, 1860s, 1870s were the earliest movements, I think, just as people who didn't have access to uh, hereditary uh, titles in the you know, um, governance at Six Nations at the time. And uh, like any government anywhere, anytime, there's always kind of people who are unsatisfied with uh, their government. Um, you might have seen a few folks driving around with Canadian flags on hockey sticks these days, as an example. So there's, no, you know, that's not new. Um, but these were people who were, the Horners generally tended to be people who were uh, thought that we needed to have an updated system of government. They felt that the Confederacy Council was too slow and outmoded in their uh, ability to make decisions um, wasn't entirely true because as uh, this presentation has shown that there was a lot of forward thinking, right? Uh, the Confederacy chiefs set up a school board, They've, um, they paid teachers, they built schools, they um, erect, uh, erected a hospital. There was a lot of very modern up-to-date things happening on the reserve and they were um, forward thinking in that if they built schools on the reserve, our kids wouldn't have to go off to the residential school, right, at the Mohawk Institute, that kind of thing. But there were those who felt differently that there could be, um, you know, a better system of leadership that they would have access to. So that's where the De Horners kind of wanted to get rid of the Confederacy model in favor of an elected system as per the Indian Act of the time. And so that was, you know, you, depending on who you read, and, and what they're referring to, there was maybe a third of the population were dissatisfied with uh, the Confederacy, uh, a third who were fully in support of the Confederacy, and a third uh, who kind of, you know, were okay with things as they were. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Well, maybe it's not because that's what 1924 is all about. But, um, you know, there were Christian chiefs in the Confederacy Council. Uh, there were, uh, you know, bringing up all of these people that we're talking about too. The other thing about the war, first war that was so important is that a lot of traditional uh, longhouse guys, Confederacy supporters, Confederacy families, they went over uh, the Bumberries and many, many others, as well as um, you know, uh, men from Christian families. But what happened was like, as, as Taylor and Talina were saying is that when they came back with the Soldier Settlement Act and stuff, that kind of caused a division. And because uh, our, our men went uh, and women, my grandmother went um, as a nurse. Um, but anyway, when they went over, um, when they got back, they were kind of in trouble, I guess, with the Confederacy because they fought for either Canada or the United States, right? They kind of stepped outside the circle. They, the Confederacy did not declare war on Germany. So they felt that they were kind of fighting for a different country. So therefore they, you know, um, in some cases, Again, depending who you talk to and who you read, there was a full on confrontation with those families, meaning they had um, you know, basically what, given up their sovereignty because they fought for our old allies, stuff like that. Um, anyway, it caused a disruption as Taylor was saying with the Soldier Settlement Act, which was a political thing. And that's because kind of the basis of what happened in 24, when you put all these different pieces together. So there were, there were Confederacy and Longhouse um, individuals who were uh, at odds with the Confederacy at the time too, because of that action. Um, and that was, you know, um, whether that was a factor, I don't think it was a direct contribution to 24, but it was certainly a factor. So, um, yeah, uh, there were dehorners from all stripes of, uh, the community, but there were also, uh, Christian families who were com in complete favor of, uh, the Confederacy Council as well. So. These are some of the discussions we'll have ongoing, but there's, a, like I said, a lot of stuff happening, a lot of really interesting history. Um, um, Rick, so I just wanted, um, there's the one comment here about uh, that we fought in the War of 1812 and I just wrote as allies. So I think that was sort of the, the clarifying point on the participation in the war was that the Confederacy wasn't asked to participate, right? Right, and, and there wasn't Canada, right? So, um, we were still 
allies of the British under the terms of the Turo, let's say, and, and you know, Silver Covenant and all that kind of stuff. We had an ongoing relationship with them as allies. But um, once Canada became a country in 1867, uh, our, our men were, you know, fight, you know, about the 114th Battalion, I guess, went over as a Canadian uh, unit. So it's a bit different story, right? So that's, we didn't have an agreement with Canada the same way we did with the, with the British in the War of 1812. So there, again, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, um, it's a matter of principle. And I think that's what the Confederacy was standing behind. They didn't want to show kind of a weakening of our sovereignty, right? Um, anyway, there's lots to be talked about there, but that's the big difference. It seemed to me that, um, that all of the discussions happening, the things that we're talking about today and, and other stuff, uh, was really in response to what Canada was up to. The other thing, you know, Canada uh, was okay with how we were doing things. I mean, you think about it. And I said this last time too, and I don't know, I'm just checking the time here. Uh, and I'm happy to have more conversations. I don't wanna, I just raise more questions for this. But like I said at the outset and, and all of these things that we do, it's about a, a discussion. It's not a lecture by any means. You know, we're just sharing with everybody some of the things that we do uh, and are interested in. But I'm more interested in this community discussion um, about all of these things. But a lot of, you know, Canada was, um, I don't want to say satisfied. I'm not sure what the word is. Uh, they understood Grand River as being a very, like a, like a flagship best practices model of indigenous uh, community life, really. And that was run by the Confederacy, but they couldn't really um, support that, right? They were uh, uh, at odds with that because you think about the Indian Act was put in place in 1876, saying that there'd be no more traditional governments and you know, native com Indian communities, whatever we were called back then. So um, Six Nations and a small handful of other communities across Canada were, were still governed by traditional councils. But Canada couldn't really do anything because our Confederacy was so strong that people were satisfied. The, you know, there was good farmlands, as you could see, people had nice houses. Like it wasn't um, as disruptive. So they didn't want to, if it wasn't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. But they also understood that there, it's kind of contravening their own policies. So something had to be done. So some will say that all along, Canada has been looking for these little cracks in our community to kind of get their hooks and, and disrupt all of that, right? To go to that elected council that they wanted so badly, let's say, but they couldn't really do it at the time because there was no real reason to do so until the De Horners came along, a small faction, I don't want to use faction, a small group of people who, um, who you know, felt that our community would be best served by a more democratic system, let's say, an elected system where everybody had ability to kind of be a part of the government. And so that's what they utilized along with the, the conflict around the Soldier Settlement Act and all sorts of things. And, and Taylor brought up another good point too, is that there was a, a lot of loss of a big time um, uh, death rate in our community at the close of the First World War with the Spanish flu. Um, my dad would tell me stories that, um, that his uh, older family members would talk about too, uh, when entire families would die in a weekend. Um, and including some of the old folks, the, you know, the, the community people that Wad well, talked to that Taylor referred to. So that was, you know, a big, we were grieving as well um, in, the, in, the, in the years following the First World War on top of all this political stuff. So we're kind of in a weakened state, right? And kind of looking for answers or a best way forward. So there's all those things to consider too. So like I said, at the outset of today's meeting, it's not just about what happened in 1924 and and um, the, the RCMP coming in and getting rid of the Confederacy, there was a lot going on. And that's what I think what we're talking about today is kind of, um, you know, setting the stage for that. Um, but out of conflict, you know, important things come forward too, right? As we've seen in the great law, like, you know, the great law is this marvelous uh, governance structure that has sustained our people for so long, but it came uh, as a result of the, probably the most tremendous conflict our people had ever known, you know, to the point where, you know, we were warring against one another for no good reason anymore, right? So we got to think about it that way. Culturally, you know, we're okay with conflict. Um, it's how we emerge from that uh, is what's kept our people strong. And I think that's the other thing too, as we talk about 24 is, yeah, it was a point of conflict also, but what happened, our, 
you know, our people continued, you know, we got through a depression, we went through the Second World War together, we found ways to, 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 um, to unify, whether through family or neighbors. Um, we weren't at such a great political um, dissension that we, you know, wouldn't help one another. It, it, to be quite honest, it, it feels that there's more political dissension and, and internal anger in this community now than there probably was back then. So anyway, and that's what we're trying to do is to sort of think about how we can move forward um, for the next hundred years, the same way our ancestors were able to pull together, and get us to this point. <laughs> um, that, that fairy picture, that's, is that looking towards the res or looking to, yeah, that's the res, right? The one that was just up. Because I remember that fairy. <laughs> Not that one, but you know, there were several. Uh, they were pretty, uh, let's just say they were restastic as far as fairies go. I think that's our next, next exhibit after 1924, eh, Taylor? <laughs> right. I heard there was like three of them or two of them at least. I heard oh, there was more than just the one. More than that. And my grandfather said there was also uh, one at Newport um, Ferry there um, back when. And there was a post office. All these little communities around the reserve were pretty thriving little enclaves like Willow Grove, Newport. Um, well, the other thing too is about Jim DeLugie. I heard lots of stories about Jim DeLugie as well because he went to Lower Cuyahoga's. And uh, there's a, that, that same picture is in the, in the dining hall at Lower Cuyahoga's. He was quite the figure at. Uh, at our longhouse there back in the day. Uh, I'll tell you some stories after. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but, that, but that also uh, is interesting because uh, if folks know, or maybe they don't know, there was a big underground railroad presence in, the, in this area, uh, like along the Grand River, like Canfield, Canboro. There's an old um, slavery uh, graveyard there um, way back when, like from you know 1860s, 1870s. And that was a connection with, um, I think, the Delugis and stuff, like you said, and a lot of people, my, my grandparents would talk about this, a lot of people in the community, like way back before there was, um, uh, you know, what, adoption and, and, and things like that, there were uh, younger white women, maybe not even younger, but white women who would just deposit their babies, um, unwanted maybe probably uh, on the doorsteps of people on the reserve because they knew native people you know, uh, respected and honored and would take care of children. So you hear lots of stories about that too. It's not really um, well known, but, um, and people you know, once upon a time could point to families uh, who were um, adoptees or foundlings, they called them, right? That was pretty common back then. And I think, yeah, Delugu is one of them too. Uh, he lived on uh, Seventh Line, I think. Mm. Anyway, no, I'm rambling. What were we talking about? Oh yeah, 1924. Anyway, <laughs> any other <laughs> questions? Any other questions? Heather, anybody? Uh, um, there is a, a question in here. Oh yes, there are questions. Sorry, I'm just, I have to scroll a little bit to see it. Um, so we have a good understanding of the events that happened in 1924 and the ongoing community divide and lateral violence towards each other because of that. To your knowledge, has there ever been attempts at peacemaking since 1924? Any attempts to bring our community together for the betterment of everyone? And then second, what do you think it is going to take to put historical conflicts, differences aside so that we can heal and move forward in unity. That's a great Phew, question. Those are good. <laughs> yeah, I would say, yeah, I, I think there have always been attempts at peacemaking uh, marriages <laughs> across Christian and Longhouse families and band council and Confederacy council. That's a good way of peacekeeping. And that's a time honored Haudenosaunee tradition for sure. There's that. Uh, but little things too, and Heather, you and I have talked about this, and, and Taylor and I too, like the Six Nations pageant uh, was done as a way to educate uh, people from outside the community and our own community about our history, our shared history on the pageant grounds there. Um, uh, gee whiz, uh, there would be longhouse guys who would uh, run for elected council to kind of you know have a, a voice there. 
Uh, there's, uh, I could name several individuals who did that as well. Just these little moments of, of um, unity and, and, and attempts to peace build. And sure, there was a principled thing, a kind of division. Uh, we kind of had to maintain that, but I think for the most part, people were actively engaged in, um, how should we say, taking care of one another, I think, uh, you know, would be my interpretation of it. Because even though you were, you know, let's say you support a band council or confederacy council, or you went to church, you went to longhouse, for a long stretch there in, in the, you know, 1930s, 40s, 50s, onward, right up until about, let's say, Oka, no one cared about Native people much. We didn't, we were kind of like left to our own devices to take care of ourselves. And, um, you know, we didn't have media attention, we didn't have TRC, we didn't have a most of the things that we take for granted these days as younger people, see, um, we were, uh, had to take care of each other in our own and we found ways to do that. Um, so I think the peacekeeping was always ongoing. And sure, there are you know, individuals and families who held a grudge, let's say, but for, for probably good reasons. But I think by and large, our, our community was um, still adhering to Haudenosaunee principles of, of um, you know, living under that longhouse and protecting and taking care of our own. We played sports together, you know, um, any number of things. We uh, picked fruit together. Uh, Rick, I was thinking together, you know, the return of, of the um, wampum as well. I think that was a pretty important moment. Oh yeah, in the, in the 80s, yeah, for sure. Um, if anyone knows, remembers back to those times, uh, Chief Bill Montour at the time, a smooth town boy <laughs> um is a, is a show of good faith when he was elected chief in the 80s i can't remember mid 80s i think um he found some of the uh the mace the council mace the wampum that was taken in 24 in a safe in brantford and returned that to the confederacy so yeah like i said moments like that have, have always been ongoing um you know the, the powwow the the pageant um the six nations fair was always a time in which people came together, bread and cheese, like those are all moments of, I'd say in their own way, peacekeeping, peacemaking uh, events, community, we call them community awareness and stuff, but back then, you know, we were just um, doing those things kind of organically. Even at the time, eh? So like some of the organic things that happened outside of either of these political systems, right? Like the the band that existed, um, like a lot of community, what would you call it, like community welfare type organizations, women's organizations, where you'd have um, people who were both uh, Confederacy and not Confederacy or, or Christian and Longhouse um, participating. Party. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> yeah, that you don't hear about, right? Is there still one? I don't even know if people, some people might not even know what that is. Heather, could you explain, please? Oh, sure, Rick. I'd love to. <laughs> I have to put my computer in. Okay. Yeah. So there is just um, all these different organizations, essentially, that were created to do things like fundraise for um, for families if they needed something. Um, there was a, a group of women who, uh, during the war, they got together and they knitted socks for men. Um, that were overseas and so even though the confederacy had sort of this official position about the war they still gave money uh to those women to do to make the socks uh to send overseas taylor's got yeah lacrosse teams in here then and now i would say <laughs> um but yeah benevolent societies essentially existed for for community well-being and um kind of like the way like now when you would have like the food bank um or you might have Anytime that like a, a club or an organization does a fundraiser for the community, it's kind of the same thing. So um, those are outside of political systems, but they're ways that people come together to care for the community at large. And those existed then and they exist now. Mm -hmm. And if you look at old council minutes, Confederacy council minutes, uh, they would accept, um, I guess applications for money too, uh, in similar types of ways that I don't think, I think band council did away with because they were more governed by uh, Ottawa in terms of, you know, acting as a kind of a welfare agency, let's say, but uh, the Confederacy Council certainly did um, take uh, requests for funding and would help people out. 
And it's good to note too that um, in 1922, Ottawa actually froze the Confederacy Council funds um, as well as the um, annuities that community members were receiving from the trust. Um, so from 1922 to 1924, the Confederacy was operating without really any financial access to, fi their fine to the finances of the community. Um, and we will have more of these conversations, I promise, because there's so much more material <laughs> to, to go through. And I think I will say, even when the exhibit's in, uh, I have to find a creative way of doing this beyond post-it notes, but I don't think that what's up on the wall will necessarily be the final word because I'm sure uh, those of you that are here or those of you that watch this after or folks that come will have more stories to share and different perspectives. And we really want to encourage that to continue even when things are up on the wall in the gallery space. Yeah, that would be that would be great. Um, and yeah, it, uh, getting back to your first ask, Heather, too, that it's just like any kind of thing that your family may have. Um, from that time period or any time, you know, we'd like to collect that and, uh, you know, utilize it towards not just 1924. And I may get in trouble for saying this because Janice, the director at Woodland is always saying, you know, that Woodland is like the reserves attic, you know, <laughs> everybody's family stuff goes there, right? Because uh, there's no place else to put it. But, you know, it would be nice to, um, to uh, gather a lot of these things uh, together um, somewhere if, if an archival facility or a museum, let's say, because uh, it's interesting to think about how our people got through uh, difficult times um, using our cultural traditions as ways to either make money or sustain ourselves, right? And that's sovereignty. When you can dig your own well or, um, you know, know how to even, you know, put in an outhouse. These are all kind of, you know, green things that we hear so much about now, what our people knew kind of organically because they had to, because we didn't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of know-how. And we sort of lost that over time because over the years we've been kind of conditioned to um, accept, you know, Western ways, let's say, uh, as a convenience thing. And um, now we realize that that's not that healthy. Uh, look at all the, the degradation to the Grand River and our natural environment. Um, you know, things like tobacco farming on our community is very unhealthy but that's not a topic that people really want to, to take up and uh, any, any, any number of things. But as we were saying earlier too, these are the kinds of things that were facing our community in, in 1924. As Heather was saying, the deforestation, the deforestation of our community was a concern, much like uh, illegal dumping now is, or um, you know, um, that kind of thing. So uh, what's, that's why I think the, the question about what have people done in the past uh, to get through, there's some answers that, that lie in uh, what did happen 100 years ago. Um, we're just able to share these things uh, via the internet and on Zoom. Whereas before, like Taylor was saying, you know, people would get together in people's homes <laughs> and tell stories. And that was, you know, your only kind of, that was a form of entertainment, but it's also brought you together and you shared these things the way we are now. Um, but, you know, Think about it. Our, that's the other thing too, is we don't realize that our people's worlds were pretty small back then. And they did revolve around community. No one really had a car, um, very few horse, you know, horse and buggies maybe, but you didn't get out a whole lot. So you were um, um, connected more closely to your neighbors and your friends and family than maybe we are nowadays, other than maybe Facebook or something, but you know what I mean? So we had to rely upon each other and our own devices to take care of one another. Um, is what I guess was what I'm trying to say, but that had an impact upon, you know, how we saw the outside world too. But I think that sharing of our information and our history with people like Wa and uh, Hewitt and stuff, you know, we're still, we're using those things today as, as today is an evidence, or we're using these things today that things were shared to, to kind of think about our future, which is really, really, you know, cool, right? I think that's why, you know, Taylor and Talene and Heather and myself get so excited about this stuff because uh, it's uh, it really speaks to us, you know. It really and to our community uh, is how we got by. I think that's really neat. Anyway, I'll end there because we're we're probably got a, just a few more minutes for questions.
So this is sort of the last call for questions for now. I mean, you're always welcome to email them. Um, I put my email in the chat there a couple of times, Taylor or Talina. I don't know if you want to put them in or if you want people to email me. I don't know. It's totally up to you. I do a lot of admin stuff, so I'm always happy to do more, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, you know, please, uh, if you think of a question afterwards uh, and you want to reach out, please do. Um, uh, yeah, and if you have stories or material to share, uh, <laughs> yeah, Janice uh, probably would be upset if we say that there's room because there isn't, but we can always take photos of things and share them um, in the exhibition uh, if, you know, if you give us permission to do that, uh, and that would be wonderful. There's always going to be more opportunity with the law project as well when we move beyond the law collection. Um, and when we start going into the website and things like that to um, integrate any family stories, histories, podcast, anything that anyone might want to write or direct themselves, like it's um, hopefully going to be a very involved community endeavor. So we're looking to encourage people to participate and make it their own in any way they would like. So um, yeah, if it can't fit in 1924, we uh, come ask us and we can, um, see if there's something that you might want to do uh, with our website or our project. I'm going to amend what I said and I'm going to say go to Talina first <laughs> because uh, an exhibit is a limited amount of space. <laughs> but I think, yeah, like it's, um, it's really nice that we get to work on this, but the best part of it is getting to talk to other people about it and share it with everyone. And as you can see, we're all really enthusiastic about this. Uh, and uh, we like to, you know, bring other people around to that enthusiasm. Um, so there haven't been any more questions. So maybe um, I will uh, wrap us up here. I really want to say uh, Nyala Goa, uh, you know, great thanks, big thanks uh, to uh, Rick and Taylor and Talina uh, for taking this time out this afternoon to share uh, the work that you've been doing and, uh, you know, update us on it and then also, uh, you know, connect us to it because I think that there'll be a lot of uh, folks that are excited to participate in your project and uh, going forward. So uh, I'll leave it there unless anybody else has anything. <laughs> I'll just I'll just say real quick, uh, thanks to Heather and folks at uh, Woodland, like I said, Krista and others involved. Um, but just as a reminder, everybody on the call, if there are like sort of thematic thematic areas that you would like to see covered in more detail um, around 1924, please uh, send them to Heather. <laughs> any any one of us on the call, um, whether you want to take up a particular aspect of 1924 uh, in preparation, because we we see these things as semi regular uh, gatherings, and we're happy to um, bring in other people and have discussions around certain topics that are of interest to people in the community. That was all. So thanks, everybody. Hola. No, when I get help, yeah, once we go. Hola, I guess we're done. See ya.